A very warm welcome to you. My name is Paul and a welcome to this video about debugging. This video is a supplementary material for the Python Level 1 course. The Python Level 1 course is an introduction to Python to give you a good foundation, which takes you all the way from core IO, variables, all the way to working with files. We don't cover classes in this course, but we cover a lot of foundational material. There are many other videos available. So there are seven videos in this series for the Level 1 course. And I'll soon be introducing another course in which it will be about classes and class design. But in this video, we're going to talk about debugging, how to do debugging, what debugging is, first of all, how to do debugging, and how to do debugging in PyCharm. And I'm going to give you the reasons why you need to know how to do debugging. So let's get started. We start off with a definition of debugging. What is debugging? Debugging is a process of identifying and removing errors from your code. So you're never going to write perfect code. Your code will always have some parts which don't function correctly and debugging is a process of understanding why these parts don't work correctly and figuring out and then figuring out how to fix them so you'll typically find that whenever you write your program you'll if especially the larger the program gets it gets to a point where it's easy for you to introduce errors which are very hard to track and debugging is the way you do that we use a tool called a debugger and it helps you step through the code it helps you halt the code at a certain point, observe what's happening at that point in the code, and then, and then um, you know, step through the code and figure out what exactly is going on, why is a certain variable changing in an unpredictable way. Uh, and once you understand that, you can then fix it and get to the root cause and make sure your code is better and effectively remove the bugs. PyCharm is the way to go. PyCharm has a powerful debugger built in and it's available you don't have to have the professional version of pycharm you can use even the conventional uh, the, the community version the community edition gives you all the tools that you need to do debugging now the reason why in the python level one course we talked we used pycharm instead of you know some of the other tools so there's visual studio code you could use jupyter notebooks you could use sublime or you could use any other tool that's out there but if you want to be serious about writing python code you need to use PyCharm. PyCharm is focused on Python. It has got a lot of tools integrated. And later on, if you feel like you want to become a professional and start using some of the advanced features, when you use PyCharm, you, you get a professional version of PyCharm. It comes bundled with a few other tools that allow you to work not just with Python, but with CSS, with JavaScript, with TypeScript, with HTML, it allows you to work directly with Django and all the functionality uh, that, that, that you can uh, make, make use of through Django. Um, and it, it can allow you to work with databases, not just uh, with MySQL, PostgreSQL, um, SQLite, and, and many, many other, other tools. So use PyCharm. If you're going to get serious about programming, use PyCharm. So use some of these fishy tools, you know, like I, I don't use Jupyter Notebook. It's nice to get a few things going, you know, get started and tasting, but just get started with the real thing. Oh, yes. One other thing, one other really, really cool thing about PyCharm is obviously it integrates very tightly with Git and GitHub and allows you to then have a proper workflow as a professional. So let's get started in looking at what PyCharm has to offer in terms of debugging. Now, the solution I'll be working through is Problem 10 of week 5. In problem 10 of week 5, we were looking at uh, matrix multiplication. So uh, we're going to see how to actually do the matrix multiplication. Let me just hide this. Um, and this will be one of the problems that you work through. So as you might be aware, in the Python Level 1 course, so through, through seven weeks, each week you get... 10 questions for programming challenges and you get 20 multiple choice questions to give you um, just test your understanding of, of of the content itself but even the documentation because i think the documentation is probably the most important thing when you're learning how to uh, learn a language if you have a, if you're working with a language that has pure documentation just stop find something that has good documentation because documentation is everything given that programming languages are things of design so here we have the solution of the general general multi matrix multiplication. If you're signed up as a on the tutor track of this course, you're going to have access to this. I've already pushed this to GitHub, so you should be able to pull the. Because I've added all the students 
who are on the Twitter track to the repository for this so that they can then you know view all the solutions but basically for you to do matrix multiplication that's how it's done this is documentation you can get from uh, instructions or the explanation of how general matrix multiplication works from wikipedia or any website i've structured this program into a number of functions we have the main function which is where we have the main calls and you can actually get a hint of what that looks like and then you have a function that does initialization of the matrix or you give it the two matrices that you're going to multiply then there's an actual function that does the multiplication of the matrices there's a function that's used for displaying the matrices in a neat way just to make sure that the, the user doesn't get confused and then we have a utility function here that's just used to help you get the size of a matrix now all this functionality you can actually get it using other libraries but the point of this exercise was for you as a student to understand how to think through taking a problem piece by piece and solving it in a general way. In, I think in the previous week, we had looked at solving a two by two matrix and a three by three matrix. And now this is a general solution for any size of matrix, even if it's a thousand by a thousand or you know, whatever size you have. In order for us to figure out how to do debug, we're going to look at the multiply matrices function because that's where all the bells and whistles are. And that's where all the action is. The first thing you need to do if you're going to debug a program is you need to make sure that Python is able to run that program. Now you, you'll see that if you haven't set it up correctly, so this is why I, I, I suggest that you have this design where you have, you have the main function and then you have this guard here. And what this does is just make sure that if you do an import, the, then the script won't be executed and the script will only be executed if it's called directly as the main module. So that PyCharm recognizes this and it gives you a little run symbol here. You also have this run symbol on the top right. Um, if you open in the non-presentation mode, at the moment I have it in presentation mode just to make sure that you can, you can see um, the text very clearly. Okay, so we're going to check that this runs by clicking that arrow and what you see there is that it says run but it also says debug now if it if it can run then you can debug so i've just clicked run and it's printed out um the console output so what we have here is some text that just introduces what this is about and and then it shows you the matrices in this case we are using random matrices um, we have a 9 by 8 and 8 by 7, therefore the result is going to be a 9 by 7, and that's the result of multiplication. I haven't added any rigorous tests to make sure that this is correct, but I'm just going to assume that this is correct and we are going to work with what we have here. The purpose in this case is not necessarily to find out bugs, but to show you what you can do when you are debugging. So now that we know that it's running correctly and we are, we are able to see the output, we can go ahead and now do debugging. So if we click debug here, we're going to see a number of things. One is we see exactly the same output used through on the console, but we now see additional tools here. So I'm going to go through step by step what these are. If we click on this tab here, this tab is the debugger, and in this case it's empty. But there are two parts to this. There are the frames and the variables. We'll see what those do in a minute. On the left side, you have a bunch of buttons. This is, it runs the debug. So you might want to run the debug multiple times. Then you have configurations for the run. Uh, if you click that, you see in this case, let's just make that nice and big. You see a number of settings. These are the settings for PyCharm to make sure that this runs correctly. If you have set up everything correctly, it should run without a problem. PyCharm will automatically figure out how to run you must have a virtual environment and this was all demonstrated in the getting started video of PyCharm so watch that video if you want to understand how to get started and set up correctly but in this case I am working on that's the name of my folder which is actually a git repository this is the week 5 folder and this is problem 9 which in this case because we are counting on 0 this is actually problem 10 there are some environment variables already set up and we have the Python interpreter. That's just a name there of this uh, configuration. It can be anything you want, but that's how your configuration looks like. 
these other buttons will be enabled whenever we are actually running a an actual debug so that allows you to step through the program and there is if you want to stop the program you click that to stop it this will show you what are called breakpoints we'll see that in a minute and this is you can mute all breakpoints there are other settings here you want and you could pin the tab if you wanted to run it multiple times and make sure that this is always present so for you to actually do the debugging there's one important ingredient so as we saw when we run it if you look at the console the output is just like what we had when we ran it so where does this special functionality of debugging come from well it comes from having breakpoints breakpoints are markers you place on your code to tell the debugger where to halt where to stop execution let's do that as we said we want to work on the multiply matrices function so let's just look at what's happening inside this function. So I'm just going to expand the number of these. So in order to multiply a matrix, you have two matrices A and B. The first thing you need to do is do an initialization. The initialization will give you a new matrix which has got the right size. In this case, we are representing matrices as a list, a list of lists. So it will make sure that the matrix C, which is a list of lists, will have the right dimensions. If you have starting off with A being M by N and B being N by P, you need, it, you need C to be M by P. So it's going to make sure that C is M by P. So we're going to add a breakpoint, our first breakpoint there, just to see what happens when we, we do that. And then we are going to scroll back to the bottom and we are going to click debug again. And now we should observe something different will happen. So observe a number of things. One, that line is now highlighted. And what this means is that execution has been halted at that point. The moment we do that, we'll see a number of buttons will become active. Uh, you notice here we have the resume program is now active. And now our frames and variables are populated. So let's go through what the frames is. For you to understand frames, you think back to the time that you had an exception in your program or you had an error in your program. Anytime you have an error in your program, Python will always print out a number of lines where it will show you the sequence of the call all the way to the point where you had the error. Each of those is a frame and that's exactly what you have here. A frame is a sequence of calls in your program. In this case, the first frame is the module frame, which is where the module was started being called from. And in this case, it's where sys.exit is inside the guard. And then that called the main function. So this was on line 152. And then we have the next frame is where the next call happens, which leads to the point of the breakpoint. And that's this point here which is in the main function where we call the multiply matrices function. And then inside the multiply matrices function on line 99 is where we have halted. So you'll always have the last frame will be the frame in which the breakpoint is. The variables tells you what the variables are at that point in the breakpoint. So at this point in the function, we only have A and B and it, that's what we see. So let's drill down a bit into what these are. You have these little uh, collapse and and um, expand markers and if we click on this for a we'll see that first of all a is a list with eight items and these are the eight items from zero to seven and if you look at each item it's another list which has eight items so this is a is an eight by eight matrix where each of the elements so this is element uh, the first element in the first row which is a value of minus six. So I'm going to leave that with you. Just play that with play, play with that. And then the next thing is you see for the matrix B, it's a list with eight. So it's an eight by nine. Here you have nine items. So this was the first, I, first row, which is this one here. That's the second row that's there. So the variable allows you to inspect what the variables are at that point. Now, in order for us to make any progress, as we said, the whole point of debugging is we stop at a certain point and then we're able to step through and see uh, what the, what, what's going on. 
So we have these buttons here, which allow us, which control how we step through the code. They have various functions. The first one does what's called step over. And what it does is it executes that line without following that line. So in this case, we have a function, initialize matrix. Ideally, what we'd want to do is we want to follow the execution through all the functions. But if you click this, it's going to just step over and it won't follow that function. It's the next button, step into, allows you to follow, but it doesn't just restrict to your code. It will follow all the way down to Python functions. So if you have any, any of the Python inbuilt functionality, whether it's a built-in function like, like, um, um, like range, for example, or, or any of the other tools that are provided through libraries, it's going to follow them through. Then it's going to show you that that code looks very different from yours. It usually highlights it with yellow or with, a, with some color to show you that this is not your code. So step into follows code all the way to the bottom, wherever that leads. Step into my code only stays within your code. Once you step in, sometimes you want to step out. Now, I'll add you just play with these and figure out what's, what's happening. Stepping out means that once you've gone into the code, you might want to step back out. So let's say we've gone into the in initialized matrix and we want to get back out. I'm going to de demonstrate that. And this run to CASA just speeds your stepping through the code. Instead of stepping through one line at a time, you can put it at, you put the CASA at a certain point until it run until you, you get to the CASA. But the most common way of stepping through the code will be step into my code. So that's what we are going to follow. So what do we expect to happen? We expect to now see, once we click this, we shall go into the next frame, which will be inside the initialize matrix function. So let's step there. And that's exactly what happens. We are now inside the initialize matrix function. And you can see that with these breadcrumbs here. And inside this function, again, we still have the only thing that's defined at this point are the variables A and B. We see other variables here, so we know that if we step through, we'll, we'll begin to populate our variables here with, with new variables. So let's step into that. Now, that just defines P because length is a built-in, but it is not Python. It's not a Python. It's not in pure Python. I think this is actually implemented in C. So it will not step into that. But, but Oh, in this case, I stepped into my code. Okay, then. So it's just going to stay within my code. But now we have P is defined there. And if we step in again, we now have M that's been added. We are still inside that frame. And if we step through again, now we have here what's called a list comprehension. It's going to stay in this line until it completes the number of loops. So we have M, which is eight. It's going to stay on this line for eight, eight, eight clicks through. So one, so that's iteration zero and then iteration one. So sorry, this is iteration zero. And then it's going to be one and you can tell by the variable underscore, which is what you've defined there. And we'll keep doing that until it gets to eight, seven actually, because M is eight, six, seven. And then now it's going to get out and go back. Now notice we are no longer in that frame. We have left that frame, but now we have the matrix C. Notice here that C is, we've done the initialization, we've just set it to a bunch of zeros. So if you can see, we are keeping track of all the variables throughout. So again, we define M, we define P, we're stepping through. And then we now define N. So now we have A, B, C, M, and N. N, you can notice here it is highlighted in blue, I think that means that this is the last variable that has been defined. Okay. And now we'll actually do the iterations. So since this is a big matrix, it's going to take us a long time to step through. Why don't I show you how to do the step all the way to CASA? So suppose I want to get to this point. I'll put the cursor there and then I'm going to click go all the way to the CASA. Okay. So now it's gotten to the first point in the CASA where they, at the first time where we are at, going to be at the CASA point. There are a number of things here you'll notice. Now we have a value of i, we have a value of j. Those have just been defined. And now we'll start stepping through and getting the values of 
C. C is the elements of C. What we're doing is we calculate for each of them, we add them up, and then we put them at that particular ij position. This is the reason why we need to initialize C to an empty matrix which has zeros, which we shall then populate the actual values. So let's now do some stepping through and see how the actual calculations are done. So we're going to iterate over k. So we, we're now going to set k to be the first value of 0. C is 0. k is 0. And now we get our first value of C. So <clears throat> if we do the step here, we'll have calculated that C is minus 30. Okay. And we set... Oh, we haven't we will need to completely iterate through here to then get the total value of the first value of c before we put it there so let's do that we step through okay we are adding you know you notice c is changing so it's increasing and decreasing because we have positive and negative values it keeps going up and down now c is 76 now we need to be keeping track of k Remember, k is iterating over n, n is 8, so we need to go through until k is 7. k is 5, k is 6, k is 7. So this is the last time, and once we are done with that, we are going to step out. So it will find that k is done, and now it will do the update. Now notice here, our value of c is going to change. There we go, and we have put the first value there. And then we're going to repeat that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'll put the cursor here and I'll keep stepping now all the way to this point. So notice what's going to happen. We're going to populate the second value. I think we, I think we populate either this one or we populate the next row, the first value. Let's just see what happens. Okay, so it must have done the next row first value. Oh, no, 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 we are just about to do it. So when we update it, yes, we are doing the second value in the first row. So I'll put, let me actually set the cursor. Yeah, okay then. Yeah, so we go back, set the cursor there. And we have just, so we have gotten all the way to that point. And if we step through just one more, we populate that. Again, okay, and again. Now notice, now it's filling everything. Okay, yeah, yeah, so I need to be, okay. Oh, my cursor needs to be here. Okay. Okay, now you see we are populating, we're just populating each row at a time. So we are actually watching the whole execution happen. So that's how you step through your code. We have used the step into my code and we've used the run to cursor. Okay, suppose you're bored and now you want to stop that. What do you do? Well, you could stop it, but that might leave the state in a dirty way. You could just stop it. So let's say I just click that and I stop it. So you can then click the console and see what happened. Well, it'll just tell you that you had a keyboard interrupt, which is it's like we, we've sent the process a signal and told it as if we did a keyboard interrupt, which is like a control C. Let's debug again. We click and click that. It's going to stop there again. Now let's do some step over. If we step over, we just step over that. And we can just step over everything here. Step over, step over. And let's... We can actually step all the way down to this point. And we see the final solution. We have finished. I, J, and K have all done. We are at the point where we'll, we'll just be going back to the main function, which is where we are. But let me illustrate what happens if you, if you want to resume the program. You'll use this button anytime you have multiple breakpoints. And if you have no breakpoints, it'll just go all the way till the end. So if you click the console, it just prints that it went all the way to the end. Sometimes you want to have multiple breakpoints. So in this, um, so first of all, in order to see your breakpoints, you use this view breakpoints. And that opens, it will open that and it will show you where all the breakpoints are. So we have a breakpoint at the main function. Do we have a breakpoint at the main function? Why, why is it? Ah. 
so it will just show you all the points where you have breakpoints. Uh, ah, that's strange. I didn't expect that. This is in line line nine. Ah, well, that's another module. Oh, we don't want that. We want only in this only in this uh, module problem nine. Okay, so actually we don't want this. Uh, I think we had deleted this module, so we can delete this. It's even confused. Okay, that's that must be something wrong. Okay, but this shows us the breakpoints we've put here. We have a breakpoint there. You can at this point you can clear all the breakpoints. You can disable the breakpoints. You can do whatever you want. There are other options, but we're not going to go into that for now. But that's just in case you want to see where the breakpoints are. You might have multiple breakpoints. Let me put a second breakpoint. Suppose I want to step through how we do the the printing of the matrix. So I'll put a breakpoint here. Uh, I just click on the side next to the number. And now if you click that, you'll see that you now have multiple breakpoints. And you can use this just as a quick way to go to the breakpoints. You can disable the breakpoints from here. So for example, you want to disable that. You can disable that there. Or you can, uh, we've actually disabled everything now. So I just put them back. So that was on line 131. And this was here. Okay. So let's run the debugger again. But this time, we want to go all the way to the next breakpoint. We can use this to resume. This will go to the next breakpoint. And from this point, you can then do your stepping through again. Notice that our frames are different because we are in the main program. And that's where we call the print matrix function. And we will then be in the print matrix frame. In the print matrix frame, we have two variables. The matrix, that's the local variable name. And there's a name, which is a string that is used to print against the name. So here again, we can step through, step into my code, and we can see what's actually happening. In this case, we are printing to the console. So we should, so we see that we have printed the name is equals to the size, which is what we have here. Name is equals to the size and the text matrix. And now we can step through and we can see it starts printing one value at a time. So that's the beautiful thing about using debugging is you can slow down your code so that you can keep track of where things are. So I think that is, you can, you can also evaluate expressions at a certain point. So you can open this window. And at this point, you, let's see that again. So yeah, at this point, we have a number of variables defined. Uh, just do this carefully. So, since at this point we, uh, we can open the debugger. Yes, good, good. At this point, you have E and you have matrix name and row. You can actually evaluate an expression. So, what is if E is a number, two times E? You, you can actually run that and see what, and you can evaluate that. Um, oh, you can run it, then you run evaluate, and it will show you what result is so you can even play around with variables inside at that that particular breakpoint where we have paused and you use that you use this little calculator symbol here so let's just do a recap of what we've seen as far as debugging is concerned number one in order for you to debugging your program must be running must be able to run because once you're able to run it, then you're able to have access to the debug functionality. Once you say debug, you need to have breakpoints in your code. We add breakpoints by clicking on the side. And once you run with the, the debugger, Python is going to stop at that point. And once it stops at that point, it's going to show you a lot of details about what's happening at that point. It'll show you the frames up to that point, which is just a stack of calls that have been made up to that point. And it'll show you the variables at that point. And you can look at variables at another point in the frame. So you click there, and it'll show you all the variables at that frame. You click there, it shows you all the variables. There might be special variables available at that frame. So for example, here you have the name of the functions. You have modules that have been imported. So this is a random module. I think it will show you many, many other bits and pieces. So that's basically how you do debugging. Debugging is a very important tool if you want to write high quality code 
and you want to fix errors in your code or you want to find parts of your code that are not running as expected or if you just want to understand how your code runs debugging is a powerful tool as i said before use pycharm i'm not sponsored by pycharm so i'm saying this completely based on my personal experience pycharm is powerful it gives you a lot of functionality out of the box stop using things like jupyter notebook i don't see why anyone does that it's it really doesn't make any sense and use PyCharm because it's got a lot of integrated tools. Once you get to the point where you, you know that you want to work as a professional, then you can start to get a PyCharm professional which comes bundled with a lot of other nice stuff. So that's it for this video. I hope you, it makes sense. If you have any questions, please add them to the, just include them in the comments below and I'm going to get back to you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.